Welcome, Deep Divers. So as you know, we're jumping into one of the most talked about stocks and companies of last year, Palantir Technologies. Now, this is a large and complex company, and there's a lot to dive into and cover. So we'll have to do it in several short video segments. In part one today, we want to understand what is Palantir? What problems do they solve? And what value do they provide organizations? What is the most expensive asset that organizations and humans have? And how does Palantir address any of this? Because a lot of people don't understand what this company does. And this may be why many institutions are not investing in this company yet. Now, in these deep dives, you'll learn how I evaluate a company, starting with what they do, how critical are the problems they solve, do I believe in their leadership team, and are they founder-led, and what is the value they create for customers? And I also have to understand the optionality of a company and can it mutate into an involved business? And where is it headed in the future? The great Wayne Gretzky quote stands true. We can't look at the puck and where it is now, but we must skate to where it's going to be. And that's what excites me about the company and its forward thinking leadership team. Many analysts, even some retail investors, don't really understand the potential of Palantir. Now, before we specifically start learning about the company, let's talk about what the most expensive asset is in our life, because this is a core asset to Palantir's value proposition. The most expensive asset is time, time to value for organizations, the time that we live on this earth, the time it takes to make decisions, and the time to execute responses accurately, and the time to achieve our goals, the time we get to spend with our family, and so, as you see, it's the most expensive asset individuals and businesses have because you can never get it back once it's spent. But if companies and individuals can make smarter, faster, more effective decisions that then create a cause and effect flywheel within an organization that compounds the impact of time savings for everything, then couldn't that change how a business operates? If a company could deliver such a savings, then this could drive a lot of value for shareholders, customers, and the company itself. Let's see if we can get a better understanding on how Palantir can achieve this for its customers. So what is Palantir Technologies? Let's begin with hearing CEO Alex Karp's description of his company in an interview back in 2012. Palantir is a company that's valued at nearly a billion dollars but not that many people, including those inside of Silicon Valley, know what it is. What is Palantir? Well, in every large-scale enterprise, you essentially have this problem that you have data in different databases, and it's very hard for humans to actually interact with that data. And what we basically do is we promote human-driven uh, synergies between humans and computers by integrating every data store you have, any kind of data, and at any scale. And we also provide privacy protection so that you only see the data you're allowed to see. Now this sounds like an incredibly boring problem, but actually it's the core issue you have if you want to do things like prevent cyber attacks, enforce civil liberties, enforce standards of privacy on data, or in some, in some of our work actually stop terror attacks. So the core of it is to be able to solve all these problems through your Palantir platform, right? The DNA though of Palantir is tied to PayPal. One of your co-founders is Peter Thiel. Can you talk about the beginning of the company, how you were able to grow this product from something that was created in PayPal? So the key, the two key components of that, one, what, the methodology that was developed at PayPal, which was basically the use of human analysis to reduce fraud. So they had this massive problem of, of essentially cyber fraud and was putting them out of business. They tried algorithmic approaches, so they, you go and you get algorithms, you try to reduce the fraud by applying those algorithms to large data sets. One of the interesting things about that is it doesn't work out very well because the, the the opponent is highly adaptive. You have an algorithm that finds this behavior, they figure it out, they change. What you need is a human mind that's adaptive against an adaptive enemy or an adaptive opponent. So having the human mind apply its own version of algorithms to data. Uh, and that actually was very, very powerful in reducing fraud. So since we knew that worked, we marched off kind of naively to the intelligence community and said, look, we'll build this into a product. Now, again, to a lot of your questions, the key moment here is we didn't want to do this as a service. Mm -hmm. You could say we have a methodology we'll build every time we sit down, we'll do this one, we'll do it each time and we'll charge you, we'll charge you. We had this idea that has run through our whole company that we will try to get this into a product, meaning that we would solve the underlying issues that would work in any enterprise. 
Now, what we found when we went to the intelligence community is, unlike PayPal, uh, they had uh, lots of unstructured data. The data stores were much larger. Uh, they weren't built to communicate. You had very, very technical users and non-technical users, and you had this massive issue of privacy protection So, um, and collaboration. So in the PayPal context, you allow any user to see all the data. But in the governmental or even consumer context, you can't allow end users to see every bit of data. They only get to see the subset they're allowed to see. Mm -hmm. So to take the PayPal model, which would have been a one-off approach that would require lots of services hours and turn it into a product, you had to productize the ability to integrate the data and productize the ability, but integrate the data meaning any kind of data, not just simple structured data. And that took us three years and a very, very strong engineering team it's a fairly complicated product, and that's its strength. But early on, you must have had some doubts when you're creating this product. Would it work? Would it, you know, actually be used in the market? When was your aha moment when you felt like, okay, we have something that's scalable that the government, that other private institutions are really want, going to want to use? Well, of course, it was very scary since you know doing enterprise software 2005 to 2009 was a little bit like you know starting a circus. Yeah. You know, in the middle of Palo Alto with engineers, it was not popular, or it was popular with the wrong people mainly, which was us and a couple of investors like you know Peter, who was co-founder, and so we didn't know it would actually work for till 2008, and we didn't know anyone would buy it till really mid 2008, so third quarter 2008. And until then, we were just operating on the faith that we had something really important. Now, the real proof was we saw massive adoption without a sales force. So this is how we knew it was working, because one person would email another in their, they have classified networks and say, this is awesome, you have to get that. And so one of the reasons to actually be very focused on the engineering team as opposed to a sales team is you really need to know is the delta between what they have with us and what they could have really significant. How difficult was it to break into DC to get the first government contract? When you stepped into that first meeting, what was it like and how did you make your case? Uh, we did a very bad job making our case. It was very difficult. <laughs> uh, we didn't understand what they were saying. They didn't understand what we were saying. Uh, um, I, you know, I think the first hundred meetings or so were fraught with misunderstandings and uh, you know, we basically went in and said we have this tool. We didn't understand their data sets. We really didn't understand their problems. We didn't understand their language. They didn't understand ours. We said from the beginning we're not hiring any people just because they're from government. We're just hiring engineers. Um, many of the people in our company don't own suits, still don't. But the thing that resonated with them was we said, we are not selling you a service. We are not going to come and sell you engineers. We are going to sell you a finished product and we are going to show you it, demonstrate its value against your data. How many government contracts do you currently hold today? Well, most of our contracts have massive clauses in them saying we can't, mm -hmm. we can't disclose, but I think uh, the way you could think of it is uh, if we uh, we have 280 people to really deal with the, the footprint of where, where we're at now, it would be much better if we had 450 or 500. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a sense of the scale. Do you think you're always going to stay true to that engineering is at the core philosophy? Will you ever build out a sales or marketing team? Is that ever going to be part of the DNA at Palantir? Uh, I hope not. I mean, I could get hit by a car. The core team could get hit by a car. We could, our investors could get tired of, of the fact that we don't hire sales. See, it, it, the thing is, if you are iterating on a problem that you want to be important three years from now, mm -hmm. it's better to have engineers figuring out what the core issues are and then iterate against them. If you want to optimize on revenue next quarter or even in the next nine months, you want to be ha have it heavy on sales force, long sales, short engineering. Mm -hmm. We're long on the, dealing with the most important problems that we can find, uh, dealing with them in a productized way so that they scale for the client. Um, and because we're long on that and short on what happens in the near term, we are not planning to hire salespeople. We still haven't hired any. Or we don't really hire non-technical people very often. Uh, and we don't have a marketing department. Mm -hmm. And we're not planning to get any of them. Let's digest some of the key points of how Alex describes his company. Palantir was founded on the premise of combining human analysis and artificial intelligence algorithms together for creating a software that provided most accurate method of anti-fraud prevention for PayPal. CEO Alex Karp and co-founder Peter Thiel never wanted Palantir to be a consulting service, but a software product that just worked, was scalable, and could solve a wide variety of different problems. 
In every large enterprise, you have a different set of data types, both unstructured and structured data, and there are challenges on integrating this data into the business as a whole. Some of the main challenges are unifying numerous types of data, challenges on what privacy guidelines must be followed for this data, and cybersecurity protection against manipulation of the data itself. This company started in the early ages of when enterprise software was not considered a core part of a company's business, and Palantir didn't make any revenue for its first three years. It solely focused on making its product the best it could be before its go-to-market. What resonated with the military departments was that this was not a service contract, but a finished product that they could use right away and build upon moving forward at scale. In 2012, CEO Alex Karp could not answer in the interview how many customers they had, but he did state they had 280 employees, but really needed closer to 450 to 500 to better support their growing customer base. Now they have over 2,500 employees now in 2021. And Alex believed having a core engineering-focused business provided advantages in solving larger, more long-term problems and didn't anticipate ever needing sales or marketing departments. This is a great example of business cultures evolving and adapting to the market need and demand, as Palantir hired 50 new salespeople in the first quarter of this year, and by the end of this year expects to have over triple digits in sales employees. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this content and learned something new about investing. Now, if you did like it, make sure to smash that like button. Help us deliver new content for you. And hit subscribe so this way you don't miss any other episodes of our YouTube channel. You can also listen to our network podcast, Pounding the Table, so you can learn more about stocks and learning how to beat the market. Now, are you ready to jump back in the water and dive in? I know I am. So until next time.